You've decided that Kubernetes is a good fit for you and your organization, and now you're trying to figure out how to run your clusters. There's a variety of options, but they fall into three main categories. One, setting up and managing everything yourself. Two, using a managed cluster from one of the cloud providers where they manage the system components and you only have to worry about the nodes running your applications. Or three, things like GKE Autopilot, EKS Fargate, or even Google Cloud Run and App Runner, which give you a Kubernetes-like experience with even less maintenance overhead. I'm gonna walk through each of these options to help you assess which approach you might wanna use. The TLDW is that for most people, I think that the latter two choices are much better. If you want or need the full flexibility of Kubernetes, go with the managed cluster from the cloud provider of your choice. However, if you don't need all that flexibility, choose one of the services that abstract that away. I also saw a great tweet the other day from Vlad Ionescu providing a flow chart on how he would think about deciding how to run your workloads. It's only focused on AWS, and in my opinion, when you should jump to EKS from one of the other abstractions are slightly different than his, but overall, it's certainly worth a look. The first category is self-hosted. In the early days of Kubernetes, you had to deploy and run it yourself. What does this actually mean? Kubernetes is a distributed system consisting of many components, so in order to deploy it, you would need to provision one or more machines, that could be virtual machines or bare metal for the control plane, where the system components run, set up a certificate authority to generate TLS certificates, create encryption keys to ensure sensitive data is encrypted at rest, install etcd, the distributed data store for keeping the Kubernetes state, install all of the various Kubernetes controllers, provision one or more virtual machines or bare metal machines for the data plane where you're actually gonna run your workloads, install the container runtime, the kubelet, and kube proxy onto those worker nodes, and finally, setting up networking and DNS within the cluster so that everything can talk to each other. Kelsey Hightower published an awesome GitHub repo that goes through the entire process, which is a great educational experience, which he calls Kubernetes the hard way. Obviously, if you're actually deploying Kubernetes in production, you wouldn't want to do things manually. You would want to automate as much as possible. There's many tools that can help with that, including things like COPS, KubeSpray, and KubeAdmin. With these tools, you specify your configuration, and they handle most of the details of setting up and bootstrapping the clusters for you. That being said, unless you really know what you're doing and have a team of people who are willing and able to debug potential issues, I don't recommend this approach. While Kubernetes has matured into a much more stable system than it once was, the number of ways in which things could go wrong is truly astounding. One of my friends runs a series on YouTube called Clustered on his channel, The Raw Code Academy, in which people deliberately break and then try to fix Kubernetes clusters. Watching one episode of that show will likely cure you of any desire to run your own control plane, unless you work in a large, mature engineering organization with many good reasons to do so. David, how are we going to get this uh, out of our cluster? Get what out of our cluster? <laughs> the, the everything. Uh, oh, man. Do you want me to delete all the UUID namespaces? Yeah, we could write maybe a... Uh... I don't even want to know what's in there. I just want to get rid of it. But I'm kind of scared because some of them are like two seconds old. So I have a feeling there's something nefarious. Ah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, so I wonder if it's going to help. The second category is managed clusters. Luckily for us, because of the popularity of Kubernetes, nearly all the major cloud providers have released managed Kubernetes offerings. Google released GKE first in 2016, Amazon and Azure followed with EKS and AKS in 2018, and some of the cloud providers such as DigitalOcean, Linode, or Sivo provide similar offerings now. While these products are similar, there's some important differences, including pricing, which we'll dive into in a future episode. That being said, the general idea for most of these is that you can provision a cluster and let the cloud provider handle the operation of the control plane, that is, the system components of Kubernetes, and you can use the Kubernetes API to configure and run your applications. You're able to install any extensions or add-ons that you want onto the cluster, so you can take advantage of the rich ecosystem of Kubernetes-compatible tools as you build out your application platform. I think for many companies who are building distributed systems, this can be a sweet spot. You get the power and flexibility of Kubernetes without too much of the operational burden of managing your own control plane. The third category that I'll talk about is those higher level abstractions. 
if you don't need all the features that Kubernetes provides, and instead just wait on a way to run your containers, there's a bunch of options for doing so that have popped up in the recent years. EKS Fargate and GKA Autopilot allow you to run workloads on EKS and GKA respectively without the need to set up and manage the nodes where your workloads are running. This can reduce the operational burden of setting up and configuring the cluster even further relative to the default managed cluster. That being said, you do give up some control when opting to use one of these options. You can't do things like run daemon sets with run replica on each node, and there's limitations around how certain advanced features such as mutating admission webhooks function. Hopefully, this gives you a sense of the trade-offs between managing your own Kubernetes cluster versus using one of the managed services from a cloud provider. I think for most teams using Kubernetes, at least early on, using a managed cluster is the way to go. There's many considerations when choosing one of these managed offerings and which one to go with, but that's a topic for another video. Make sure to subscribe and stay tuned for future content and check out another one of my videos over there. That's it for today, and remember, just keep building.